The next join algorithm we'll look at is the sort merge join. This only applies to equijoins and natural joins, that is, joins where there's an equality predicate in the theta. There's two stages to the sort merge join. In the first stage, we're going to sort both relations, R and S, by the join key. And this is going to get all the tuples in each relation that have the same key together in consecutive order. Now, in some cases, your input might already be sorted, let's say because the optimizer has placed another sort before the join for some other reason, maybe another sort merge join. Um, and so in the case where the input is sorted, obviously we don't need to sort it again. The second phase then is a join pass in which we scan the two relations to be merged, which are already sorted on disk, and we merge them together emitting tuples that match. So let's see how this works through some pseudocode. So to begin, we have these two relations, we'll call them R and S, they're on the upper right. R is in blue, S is in orange. And let's walk through pseudocode of an iterator to do the sort merge join. We start by checking to see if there's a mark variable, which we'll define soon. Right now there isn't one. Because there's no mark variable, we're going to advance R until it's as big or bigger than S. And then we'll set a mark on the place where S is. So we'll see that mark up there in black. If they're equal, then we start having matches. So we set the result variable to be the current values of the R and S pointers on the right. We advance S for a future call to next, and we return the result as output. So that's our first return from the next call to sort merge join. It's returned one tuple, and it's left internal state for the two cursors on R and S and for the mark variable. When we get called again to do next, we check to see if mark is true, and it is. So we check to see if we have another pair of matching tuples, and we do. So again, we set the result to be the pair. We advance S1 further, and we return that result. Now we've called next twice. On the third call to next, we still have our internal state of R and S and the mark. So the mark is there. We check to see if R equals S, but it no longer does. And as a result, we're going to rewind the S cursor back to the mark. That's what the mark was there for. It was there to remember when we get a new tuple where to restart S. And we'll advance R to the next tuple. We set mark to null now, and we go back to the top of the loop. At the top of the loop, if not mark, which is true in this case, we're going to advance R and S until they match. And we set a mark. And now, if they match, we have a new result tuple. We advance S as we've done before. And we return that result to next. OK, on the next call to next, we check for the mark. We find it. So we go back into checking to see if there's another match. There is another match. We advance S. We return the result. On the next call to next, we check once again for the mark. There is a mark, but the two variables are not equal. We've got 31 and 42. S has gone too far. And here you can see now we're going to reset S to mark, advancing R. And now you can understand the reason that we set the mark and we rewind it. It's because there may be multiple left tuples, in this case with value 31, that match a batch of right tuples. So we set the mark to null. We go back to the top of the loop. We say if not mark, we uh, check to see if r is less than s, s is less than r. They're not, so we set the mark. And again, we start emitting outputs, this time for the left-hand tuple lover 2. When we get called back around, we've got yet another match. So we do the right thing here, advancing S off the end, returning the result. And now, the next time we get called, we check for equality. We're not equal. We reset S to mark. We advance R. And we start over again. And here, we advance S until it's bigger than R, set the mark, but they're not equal. So we go through this logic. We advance R, set the mark to null. We're at the top. We set the mark. They are equal in this case. We create a result. We return the result to next. S is now pointing to end of file. But that result is part of the output. And the next time we get called, we'll find that we're already at end of file when we start advancing R, and we'll declare end of file for this iterator.